Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Resource Insider Podcast. Today I sit down with Walter Cole, the CEO of Skeena Resources. This is a very interesting interview. Walt takes us through the ups and downs, the challenges, uh, and the opportunities of running a mining company. And there's no one better to talk about this, I think, than Walt. They've taken Skeena from a relatively unknown company. A couple years ago, they were trading at 30 cents a share. Today, they're over 350 a share. Um, they've gone from nothing to a 5.6 million ounce gold deposit. They've over overcome tremendous hurdles along the way. And for anyone that is serious about investing in mining companies, particularly professional investors, I think that this episode is a must listen because it really gives, um, I would say, an accurate and honest description of what it's like to run a mining company and the challenges that have to be overcome and what can be achieved through hard work and perseverance. So without further ado, let me please introduce Mr. Walter Cole, CEO of Skeena Resources. Mr. Walter Coles, welcome to the newest episode of the Resource Insider Podcast. How are you today? I'm great, Jamie. Thanks for having me on your show. So I feel like this conversation has been about a month in the making. Uh, you know, we were introduced through my partner here at Inventa Capital, Craig Parry, of course, the, the chairman of your company, Skeena Resources. He has had many, 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 many glowing things to say about you and what's going on at Skeena. So I wanted to take the chance today to, to dig into what's going on at Skeena, why investors should care, why people are excited right now, and of course, sort of tell the story behind Skeena, how you guys got to where you are today and, and the people behind it. So thank you very much for taking some time out of your day and sitting down and talking with us. Yeah, I, I think Skeena is a, a product of uh, frankly, you know, I would almost call it the, uh, the Canadian system. I mean, there's such incredible uh, technical talents in Canada. And, and obviously, there are also incredible natural resources uh, that exist in the, you know, on the Canadian uh, continent. Uh, and and you, you bring these two things together uh, and, um, you know, the outcome is, is companies like Skeena and, and, you know, tens or hundreds more that have been incredible success stories that have come out of Vancouver. And I think Skeena is just the, the latest, uh, you know, iteration of this uh, incredible ecosystem that exists there. So, you know, that brings me to one of the questions I have here. So, cause you are not from Canada, you are from Virginia. Is that right? Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. That's so right. how does a gentleman like yourself from Virginia get involved in the Canadian junior mining game? Yeah, I, I used to say uh, a lot of bad luck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, the reason I, was, I, I, I jokingly say that is because this is a tough business. It's really hard and you have to have perseverance uh, to succeed. Um, uh, my uh, my parents have some farmland in Virginia that, that have have minerals, uh, uranium deposit and uh, the lure of 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 uh, riches and creating a company around developing that was irresistible. So I left uh, a job working in finance in New York to uh, create a company to develop that a mineral deposit on family land. And I had the good fortune of uh, meeting a person who became my uh, a mentor in, in, in taking me into the mining space. And that was uh, Peter Groskoff, who's the CEO of, of Sprout Asset Management. He said to me, he, about the deposit in Virginia, you have something that we could create a company around. Mm -hmm. And he brought in investors uh, like Luca, Lucas Lundin and, and Sprout Asset Management and, and Ned, uh, Ned Goodman. Uh, so we had a like really a blue chip uh, uh, base of investor support with that project. But, you know, I learned the hard way that mining is a very complex uh, business and a lot of things have to come together to create a successful project yeah. beyond just a, uh, a good deposit. And, and we got held up in Virginia on permitting. Like we just couldn't get the permit. And, uh, after, uh, going through the courts and, and spending a lot of money on lobbyists, I, I realized it was, you know, time to, to, to move on. And I had a choice go back to finance 
or do something again in the mineral space. And a very famous geologist, Ron Nelitsky, was on the board of the Virginia company. And he suggested, why don't we try to do something in Western Canada? And, and our original idea was uh, Ron would handle the technical side. I'd do capital raising because I have a background in finance. And we decided to focus on Western Canada, specifically the Golden Triangle, and be contrarian. You know, as, as Rick Rule always says, you're either a contrarian or you're a victim. So we tried to take this to heart and uh, acquire assets during a, a really horrible downturn in the space. So 2015, 14 time period mm -hmm. and um, and focus on an area that he knew very, very well uh, because he's credited with the discoveries of SNP and SK. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the circular path. And, and Ron has been on this podcast and I highly recommend listeners, you know, go back and check that out. Cause you know, there's, I don't know if there's anyone that's made more discoveries in, in Western Canada than Ron. It's, you know, it's, I can't even remember the, the, the depth and length of it, but I was blown away by the number of discoveries to his name. Yeah. Ron's a, he's a national treasure. Uh, he's a walking encyclopedia, not just Canada, South America, Africa. Um, the guy, uh, you know, has, such a incredible experience set and wisdom set uh, on the technical side of deposits globally. Mm. So, you know, this, this comes back, you know, to something I think about a lot in that, and I, I come at it from the exact opposite side of you. Uh, you know, I'm a mining engineer. I've spent my whole career in mining and then I moved up into mine finance. And this was for the big, certainly a big part of my career, the only finance world that I ever knew until I sort of, broadened my knowledge to the more the more general finance space and it was at that point i realized what a um, unique and kind of weird world mining finance is and you know i want to ask someone that came from it sounds like a very traditional background you know uh finance in new york did mining finance or commodities did that ever come across your desk or your radar uh when you were working on i assume wall street uh yeah most definitely it did um when I worked at UBS, I, I did some work in the metals and mining space. Mm -hmm. When I was at an investment fund, we invested in natural resources. Um, I remember one of the most like impressionable trips I took was a tour of the oil sands uh, up in northern uh, uh, Alberta. Um, I mean, I, I was blown away by the natural beauty of Canada and these incredible uh, projects that were uh, being created, whether it was on the paper and forest side oil and gas side, or obviously the mining side as well. Uh, it's just a tremendous expertise that exists uh, in Canada. So so mining finance wasn't sort of entirely foreign to you when you went out and launched this Virginia uranium company. Is that correct? Or am I misreading? I mean, I thought I knew what I was doing, but uh, I mean, there's so many nuances to it and you start to peel back the layers and, and um, you know, whether it's streaming or royalties or I remember the first time I saw press releases with uh, flow through deals. Uh, you know, I was working at a hedge fund in New York. I, I was like, what the heck is this thing going on? And then the bought deals, like a, a New York fund, you know, you just see the press release deal bought overnight done. And you're like, what just happened? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I sort of feel like you're always learning in this space or, yeah. or in the industry. And why was that? You know, why was that confusing the bought deal? Is it because perhaps a fund would be interested in investing in a specific company and they would maybe they would want to participate in the financing and they'd see like, shit, it's gone. Like before we even had a chance yeah. to put our toe Look, in the water. Canada's clubby. That's my impression. Is, uh, you know, a, a handful of banks all do, you know, they kind of all syndicate together. Um, a handful of funds, there's specialist funds that, that really know the space backwards and forwards. Um, so a generalist fund trying to figure out the space, it's not the easiest uh, thing to break into. At least yeah. I remember feeling like when I was at the fund that that um, the really good deals got were gone before we even knew about them. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, that's been been our focus at, at Resource Insider is sort of finding yeah. these things before they hit the open market. And, you know, it's it's to your point, it is very clubby. It's who you know, and if you can tap the right relationships early on, you often get access. And if you can't, you don't. And, uh, you know, it can dramatically impact your returns, depending on what stage you're getting into these deals, as I'm sure you know. So, I, you know, I have a question for you, and you can answer this from one or two of, or one or two or both perspectives. 
you know, what do you see? Yeah, let's start with this. What do you see as like the mistakes uh, newer investors to this space are commonly making, you know, and let's look at it, you know, from a slightly different perspective than we've answered this, asked this question before on the podcast, but like say funds, say professional investors that are new to the mining space, guys that are obviously sophisticated, have access to capital, know what they're doing in the broader finance realm. They step into the mining world. Where do you see them making mistakes in your experience? Or perhaps where did you make mistakes? I, I mean, it's like where to begin, uh, it's a very long list of mistakes. Um, uh, I guess the, the, the thing that's hammered into my head, um, and I've seen this through personal experience is there's a sharp, there's a steep learning curve and newer management teams are going to make mistakes. And I made lots of, them. um, there are, are things we did at Skeena in the first couple of years that were just you know, in hindsight, really stupid mistakes. And, and I'll give you a prime example, um, taking money from dedicated flow through funds. Like I did not understand their whole mechanism that four months later, a dedicated flow through fund is going to be selling your stock. Mm -hmm. so it's like, I, I feel like they, they, they were creating, I don't know how prevalent it is today. I think it's less today, but sort of like heroin junkies out of little junior mining companies, because you're desperate for the money. They give you the money. And, and it's toxic capital because it's gonna, it's gonna hit the market uh, you know, a, a few months later. And if they're not buyers there, it's gonna, it's gonna whack your share price. Right. So it's, it's a shortcut. You get the capital, but it ends up destroying your share price because you didn't find long-term investors in your company. So as a management team, that was a, a huge mistake that we made early on. Can um, you, um, for people not familiar with this term, define broadly what, what flow through is, what you're referring to there? Yeah, so it's this wonderful program in Canada where there are tax incentives for uh, individual investors, or, or I should say taxpayers in Canada, to buy shares in uh, resource companies, meaning companies like, could be an oil exploration company, a mineral exploration company. And the idea, the, the term flow through comes from the idea of, of flowing the losses, because these companies have no revenue, they have no income. So every quarter they're generating losses. So the flow through investment allows the company to flow the losses up to the investor. And so the investor is able to, to take a tax credit for making that investment. So it almost so it, acts as a donation in some ways, like, like you would give to yeah. charity in some ways, it looks like. Well, I mean, that's a more complicated aspect to it. That's called the charity flow through swap. But just the, the, the direct flow through investment is just flowing tax credits up. Mm -hmm. and. And so you get a hundred percent deduction on your investment. So, you know, let's say you're, you're investing a million dollars in a mineral exploration company as flow through, you're going to get a 100% deduction against your income tax on that investment. So depending on your tax rate, if you're at the 50% tax bracket, um, you know, basically right away, you're getting a, a $500,000 tax credit. Right. It's incredible. Like you Pretty own the stuff. Yeah. And you got a five hundred thousand dollar tax credit. So, you know, the way the industry has evolved is, is we we sort of split that tax credit with the investor. If the stock is trading at ten dollars, we sell the stock at at twelve fifty. And, and so the, the investor is giving up two hundred fifty thousand dollars of that tax credit to the company by paying a premium to market price. Right. Right. So, and there's also, you know, people should probably be aware certain restrictions and limitations on what the company can use that money for that's raised through flow through. Is that right? It has to go directly into the ground for exploration purposes. That's correct. It can't be used for uh, a GNA. It can't be used for overhead expense. It has to go towards finding, you know, oil, gas, or minerals. And so this is really a program designed to incentivize discovery across Canada. It's incredible. I mean, basically, there's nothing like know, this in the U.S. Is there, uh, to my knowledge? No, no I don't yeah. think there's anything like it anywhere else in the world. And um, you know, people talk about how you know Alaska or the U.S. has a cheaper income tax, corporate income tax rate. I, I mean, lately, you know, it looks like it's going to change up to 28 percent, but it's definitely lower than it is in B.C. Our our corporate tax rate is like I think it's around 37 percent. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, there's an advantage to building a project in 
in Alaska, except that the operating expenses in Alaska are higher. And in Canada, I mean, very smartly, the Canadian government has said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna help people pay for going and looking for minerals with the idea that if somebody finds something, we're gonna get refunded all that, those subsidies right. on expiration and the taxes that we'll generate off of these projects. I think it's a fair, I think it's a fair bargain and it's a, it's a really smart, smart program. You know, how many, how many companies do you think are actively thinking about this when a, maybe an experienced management team, they've had wins before, they want to go out and start their next project or look for their next discovery. Do you think it, it really incentivizes these management teams to focus on Canadian discovery versus elsewhere in the world? Yes, yeah. 100%. I mean, Quebec's, because there's, there's two uh, aspects to the tax credit. There's the federal tax credit, and then there's the provincial tax credit. Yeah. And, and Quebec has the highest provincial tax credit, right, for, for these programs. Um, and it, it has led to Quebec having a booming mining industry. Yeah. And, and I do think uh, uh, the, the government of BC has observed that, recognizes that, and it has taken it to heart. Because I know there have been discussions about raising um, the tax credits for exploration in British Columbia. And I think it would be a terrific thing if they did it. It would just lead to more investment into the exploration industry in British Columbia. Yeah, and Quebec has got to be one of the best places to explore in the world. Because in addition to those flow through credits, there's also the Quebec sort of sovereign funds, so to speak, right? These funds that have a mandate to invest their capital, often quite large funds with within yep. the province. And there's not a tremendous amount of industry in the in the province of Quebec and mining and exploration makes up a very, very big part of it. So you've got these funds that are forced to push capital into these companies and they they, you know, they tend to not sell. They tend to hold and hold and hold yep. because that capital has to be deployed. So the access to money for Quebec focused exploration companies is uh, maybe unparalleled that I can think of. And you hit the nail on the head about the long-term, uh, that, that being long-term capital. It's a really difficult thing in the mining space where these projects can take 10 to 15 years to come to fruition. If your shareholders are, are trying to, you know, make a quick buck, buck and flip, you know, on, you know, on a quarter. Yeah. Like how, how do you build a company if all your shareholders are constantly flipping the stock? Um, you can't. And it's a mismatch with uh, the nature of this business. You need investors who who have the patience and the fortitude uh, to see you through the you know frankly the investment cycles and to some degree the commodity cycles yeah for sure and you know this is something we talk with companies about at resource insider all the time is you know finding those right investors and you know i'm going to get a lot of shit for saying this but in a lot of ways canadian investors are the worst investors for mining companies because Canadians as a whole tend to be overserved by mining opportunities. They get every Canadian investor, especially every credit investor, especially, especially every Canadian institution has had mining deals thrown at them nonstop for since the beginning of time. And they have a mentality of like, get in, get out, clip that fee or clip that bump very quickly. And I find U.S. investors tend to buy in and to believe in sort of the bigger, longer-term picture, either the commodity or the specific company. And, you know, I'm a Canadian. I work with lots of Canadian investors, but I do find the U.S. investors tend to be better, more committed long-term shareholders. Is this, you know, you don't, you, you can either agree or disagree with that if, if you'd I, like to. I 100% agree. Another mentor of mine, uh, Keith Beck, he always says to me, horses for courses. So, uh, you know, when you're starting out at a, a truly venture stage, a mining project, uh, there are very few investors in the world who will take that risk. Mm. There, are very, there are almost no funds in the United States that want to play that game, uh, but there are funds in Canada who will take that very high level of risk. And, and so I guess that's, you know, that's, that's a really positive side that there's an investor base in Canada that will uh, support such risky early stage endeavors. Um, the flip side of it, the negative side is there's so many of those opportunities that you're often highlighting uh, that that Canadian investors can become a bit like, I guess I would use the term deal junkies. Yes. Like constantly yeah. looking for the next incredible opportunity. And, and the truth is they're on the, they have that perch to see those opportunities where no one, 
uh, not many other people have the expertise or the opportunity. Yeah. And I think, you know, the world doesn't quite recognize that Canada, you know, particularly Vancouver to a somewhat lesser degree, Toronto is the, the venture ha capital yeah. hub of the, the resource space for sure. Yeah. It's what Palo Alto used to be for tech. Mm -hmm. You know, Vancouver it used to be interesting. Why it used to be? Where do you think it's going? Oh, I just I talked to I, I've got some good friends who are in that. They've all left. They're all in they, Austin and Florida now. Is that right? Well, yeah, they were in Malibu and now they seem to all all have gone to to uh, Miami. Fair Austin. enough. OK, we're getting off topic here. We've talked about the things that can go wrong. Let's talk about some of the things that can and have gone right for Skeena. I'm going to read a couple of facts that I pulled together for this interview. Tell me if I'm right or I'm wrong. You guys are up over 300% so far on the year in your share price. Uh, you have the highest grade underground silver mine in the world. Your proposed or your projected IRR is 51% at a 1325 gold price. You know, we're at 1750 today. Um, and you currently have an open pit indicated resource of 5.3 million ounces at 4.3 grams per ton, which is a very high grade for an open pit project for people who don't have um, maybe the context for that. And finally, your project's projected payback period is 1.2 years, which means that the time it will take to pay back the capital costs invested is, you know, 1.2 years. All those things correct? More or less. More or less. <laughs> Where did I get it wrong? Well, uh, year to date, we're not up three three hundred percent. That's that's a twelve month uh, look back. Sorry, uh, I meant to say over the last year. Yes, yeah. Thank you yeah. for the correction. So um, that's an impressive list of stats right there, and I think now's the time in the conversation for people who have not heard of Skina. We should get into what you guys are, you know, what you're doing, and why people should really be caring about what's going on there. Yeah, th thanks for uh, mentioning all those uh, very nice, nice things. Um, it's been uh, it's been five hard years to get to this point. Um, I've got two two quotes. I had a boss who used to say, "As I uh, stumble through life, sometimes it looks like I'm dancing." Um, and then, and then the other one is, you know, it's a it's an overnight success, but I mean, many years in the in the making. I mean, we toiled. Uh, where uh, I often say we toiled in the salt mines. I mean, we were close to running out of money on numerous occasions, um, living off the, you know, uh, payables. Like it, it's a freaking hard business. And, and you never know, even along the way, are you going to encounter some sort of fatal flaw in your mm -hmm. project? Like, you know, with SK, there was this reputation that it, it's a, it was an incredible high grade underground mine, but it also came with, all sorts of uh, deleterious elements like arsenic and mercury and, you know, the, that we were going down a dead end path. Like there's no way we would be able to create a saleable concentrate. And I, I remember, you know, I, I had an engineer who's no longer with us who, who, who didn't think we could make it happen. And I remember becoming physically ill when he, you know, like over the next 24 hours after he told me that, I mean, you eat, breathe and sleep these things. Mm. But I also think that's the only way to make, you know, make a success in a tough business like this. You have to be all in and you have to have a team of people who are just, um, you know, 100 percent focused and dedicated uh, to, um, you know, figuring out a way to make things work. There's the famous phrase, mines are, you know, mines are not found, they're, they're built. You're an engineer. You probably <laughs> would, would uh, agree with that, um, you know, more than any geologist certainly would. But mm -hmm. you know, yeah uh yeah it's it's like it's not easy uh and so what was I your think, share price at its lowest was it, was it around 30 cents or do i have that wrong yeah, yeah no uh in march or february of 2019 so we're talking two years ago and now you're at 350. correct yeah yeah so people that jumped in supported you at that time are up over 10x you know just buying a stock on the market in a tough market um in, in, in sort of believing in the general vision there. Now, can you tell us, you know, what what is SK Creek? For people who've never heard of this project before, who have no context, well, what are you looking at here? Yeah, so SK, as you mentioned, was a legendary underground mine 
uh, when it was in production, I think it was the highest grade large mine producing in the world. It, uh, on a gold equivalent basis, the grade was two and a half ounces per ton. And this is, this is a big mine. I mean, you know, producing like 350,000 ounces of gold. So what, a that's year. like 78 grams per ton, something like that. Yeah. 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 Like off the charts. Um, you know, I, I've been told by geologists who worked there for Barrick that it was really frustrating. They would go out and do exploration and find, you know, have a, like a great hit 20 meters of 10 grams. And they come back to the engineering guys and the engineering guys would be like, oh, that's not good enough. You got to get at least 20 grams or it can't make it into the mine plan. So, um, but granted, they, they were operating in a time period where the price of gold and silver was much lower. Uh, it was also powered by diesel and propane, uh, mm -hmm. where now we have new hydroelectric power nearby. So that's a big shift in the cost structure. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the biggest twist on this uh, project was to look at it as an open pit. And when we did that, we found this huge resource was there. Because we dropped the cutoff grade from you know, 15 grams is what they used in the past down to a, a one gram cutoff grade. And when we, when we looked at the project like that, suddenly there was this huge deposit yeah. of gold and silver there. Well, the question is why didn't Barrick mine that as an open pit? That's exactly what I was just gonna ask you. Why, you know, Barrick, one of the most successful, biggest, wealthiest gold mining companies in the world. Why do they miss this? And a junior exploration company from Vancouver can figure it out. Yeah, I, I, I don't think they missed it. It was, you know, all about place and time. So when they shut it down, it was uh, the first quarter of 2008 in the middle of the global financial crisis. Uh, at that time period, BC did not have a good reputation for supporting mining projects. And, and the idea of an open pit, you know, in the 1990s and early 2000s was considered challenging to impossible to permit. And what changed was in the late 2000s and into this most recent decade, open pit mines started to get permitted and built in the Golden Triangle. So that was, that was a major change in the playing field. And who occurred. led that? Was this like a predium probably that was leading this? Or was there was there people before that that really kind of opened no, that? I would say, um, yeah, I mean, predium was very important in, in sort of, I think, uh, helping the province improve its permitting capabilities. But also remember the Red Crisp mine is up there. Yeah, of course, yeah. 30, 30 40,000 tons a day open pit. Uh, Galore Creek, which hasn't been built, but that's been fully permitted. That's a massive like $7 billion capex open pit and underground. Uh, KSM, which is owned by Seabridge, is fully permitted. Another multi-billion dollar open pit underground combination. So, so you know, SK by comparison is a tenth of the size of those big projects. But over the period of that time, the province really sort of transformed itself into a, I guess, an international mining jurisdiction where things can get get, get done and world class operations can get you know discovered and then built. Yeah, I, I think the 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 liberal government. Uh, really led that transformation, but uh, we have to give credit where credit is due. The NDP government that's in power right now has continued that uh, those policies, if not even improved on them. Mm -hmm. And for, for viewers at home uh, who are not familiar with Canadian politics, ironically, the Liberal government is the more conservative government and the NDP government is the more progressive government there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and I'd add that I, in conversations I've had with like the Minister of Environment and the Mines Minister, they recognize this incredible opportunity that British Columbia has to uh, produce the raw materials to support this green revolution, electrification. You're gonna need copper, you're gonna need cobalt. Um, you know, silver and gold, I, I guess, can piggyback on that, uh, that theme, but you know, the overreaching message is you've gotta have uh, mining to support this uh, green revolution and BC has a really important role to play in that. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that's especially true because, you know, not a lot of people know this, that BC is primarily powered by hydroelectric power. You know, we have uh, some of the cheapest, cleanest electricity on the planet. And, you know, when, when capital allocators and government and regulators are looking at, you know, not just, um, you know, the technology that's being built with metals, but the, I guess the, I'm going to butcher, but sort of the carbon, like what, what are the, 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 the carbon cost of producing that metal? You know, there's probably going to be maybe nowhere in the world as, as, as clean, for lack of a better term, than British Columbia. 
I 100% agree with you. We're trying to work on right now with SK, uh, understanding where we would sit in our ranking from an ESG perspective uh, because of the the uh, cheap, clean hydropower that exists in PC, just as you said. So let's take a step back because, all right, Barrick shut this thing down, didn't really fit into their portfolio at the time. When does, um, you know, a young Walt Cole and Ned, uh, Ronald, Ron Nedelinski, almost called him Ned Ronalinski there, Ron <laughs> Nedelinski walk up and realize this is a project that they want to have? Well, again, to Ron's credit, he 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 was convinced that uh, certain areas of the deposit had not been mined, and that there was opportunity there. So, uh, with uh, the help of Keith Peck, who is a retired mining-focused investment banker who lives in British Columbia, uh, who had a relationship with the former CEO of of Barrick, uh, we approached Barrick with a, a pretty simple pitch. We knew they had thirty-five. Uh, former mines in their closure group. So these are mines that have been shut down. They're not planning to reopen them. They're just doing like environmental maintenance, mm -hmm. reclamation work. So these are mines with lots of cost, but no revenue potential. And so we approached Barrick and said, listen, could would you consider letting us potentially buy these assets from you that are headaches, that are costing you, you know, in, in the case of SK, $2 million a year, you're not planning to do anything with it. Why don't you option it to us? If we can figure out something to make it work, we'll take over all your environmental liability and we'll pay you for it. So, you know, light bulb goes off with Barrick. Uh, they've got 35 of these assets. Imagine if you had 35 assets, you know, just pretend they were each costing $2 million a year in environmental costs. That's 70 million bucks a year. And I don't know what earnings multiple Barrick trades on, but let's say it's 20. Like that's an easy 1.4 billion of, you know, increased market cap if you could just get rid of these things. Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me of the idea of like having a loan on a car that you've crashed and is just sitting in your backyard up on like cinder blocks and you're and someone comes by and they're like, Hey, I'll give you 500 bucks for that car <laughs> you know, yeah. and we'll take over the loan payment. Like there's not a, yeah, it seems like a no brainer. Was that like a hard, was that a hard negotiation or were they like, here's the keys? No, no, definitely not. Uh, you know, reputation is a is a huge, uh, a huge priority for Barrick. So it's mm -hmm. constantly in our discussions reputational risk. They don't want to have a small junior, let's say a, an unknown Skina, take over a project and and create a worse environmental problem. Um, so it it took time and convincing that we, you know, had the technical capability that we were responsible people. And we uh, would, uh, you know, treat the opportunity with respect and care. And I assume and, had the access to capital to actually do the things that you were claiming you could and wanted to do. Yes. And they, they started us out small. Like they let us option SNP first. And they said, mm -hmm. show us what you can do with SNP. Because um, SNP is, uh, you know, a much smaller little asset. And, and I think we convinced them that, you know, A... We had the trust of the province because the province had to sign off on the transfer of environmental liabilities from Barrick to us. Uh, so we were able to demonstrate that we had good relationships with the regulators. The regulators didn't think we were, you know, fly by night operators and and sort of gradually over time, we earned the, the confidence from Barrick to then have a shot at, at trying to do the same thing with SK. And when did you um, sort, of, sort of get get the keys to SK? We we first optioned SNP in 2015, acquired SNP in late 16, mm -hmm. and we optioned SK in 17, and we didn't fully get the keys. We we exercised the option and acquired 100% ownership of it in October of last year. Of October of last year, and I assume you know those few years there, it was all easy, smooth sailing, and there were no real problems along the way. Uh, most definitely the opposite. <laughs> so let's talk about, you know, some of the challenges. And I, I think this, the reason I'm digging into this is because people so rarely see the inside toil in a mining company that it takes from going from exploration development to towards the production stage. And there's very few companies that make that leap um, as a junior mining company. 
So like, can we talk about some of the milestones and, and challenges you guys had to overcome to get to the point where, look at there's 5.3 million ounces here. You've got a $780 million market cap right about now, something like that. And, you know, people are excited and knocking on your door and want to be involved in SK and Skeena. You know, how do you go from, all right, guys, we'll give you a test run here on the SNP project to where you are today? Yeah, I just think, uh, you know, day in and day out, we just keep coming to work and, and just refuse to give up. Um, because even when it all comes together, I still think there's a lot of skepticism in the mining space, probably justifiably. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mark Twain's famous for his quote that uh, a gold mine is nothing but a, a hole in the ground with a liar, you know, pointing at it from above. I don't have the quote exactly right, but but you know, his point is, it's very hard space to in, to invest in, because how does a, a a normal generalist investor differentiate between what's promotional BS and what's like a legitimate uh, project. And, mm -hmm. and I think one of the ways people differentiate is they just stick with management teams that have a, a, a proven track record. And, and that's, you know, for us, I think that was a really difficult thing because everybody on, most of the people on my team, like the actual management team, we're all younger in our forties and thirties. And, and there's no huge success uh, to point to. And, and so it was this, you know, just a gradual process of here's what we're going to do and delivering on it. And, and through a series of, you know, events of, of consistently doing that, I think we earned uh, the trust of uh, some bigger investors who we've been very fortunate to have their, uh, their trust over the last couple of years. But let me add that, like, we made mistakes and disappointed investors um, from that period of of 2015 to 17, we made some, we had a project called Spectrum that we spent 20 million on and it just didn't work. Like we did 20 million of exploration on this thing and it just, it didn't measure up. Uh, I remember going to uh, the offices of Ingalls and Schneider and the investor there, Bob Gibson, who, who put a bunch of money in and I came and I just, was, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you. It just, it didn't work. And I was really, really, uh, you know, uh, depressed about having to go and have that that conversation. But, you know, he he said to me, "Walt, I'm not going to sell. I'm going to, I'm not going to buy more of your stock today. But I'm not. I'm going to do you this favor. I'm not going to sell, and and get back out there and and figure something out here." So, um, so how did that? What did you that? You know, what did you guys take away from that? And how did you refocus your efforts and energy after that? Well, I, you know, what we kept doing was we kept turning over rocks. And, and by that, I mean, we kept acquiring other little projects. Um, so SK was probably like fifth or sixth project that we that we picked up in the Golden Triangle. Mm -hmm. And you don't really, like, how do you know which one's really gonna work before? You don't. I mean, the way we got this is because um, it was not obvious to everybody what SK could be. And I'll give you, you know, I told you that, that Barrett allowed us to option it after we did SNP. Well, mm -hmm. they told us that. And when we came to do the option, they go, well, I know we said that, but we've changed our minds. We need to do an auction. You know, for fiduciary reasons, we need to do an auction in this pro this property. <laughs> okay. So they, they told us they wouldn't op option it. They wanted cash offers for it. And they invited like 25 companies to submit bids. And I think at the end of the day, they only got one or two. So 25 very sophisticated companies looked at SK and said, not touching it. So to your point, there was a real lack of recognition in the market of what was potentially there. Yeah. The, I mean, Barrick had a lot of people turn over back in those days and the data room didn't have very much in it. Like you couldn't, there was no resource block model. Um, there was no way to figure out what could the environmental liabilities be? Um, and, and I'm not trying to, I think Barrick had a lot of stuff going on at that time. Mm -hmm. um, we, we withdrew from that, that bidding process because we just felt there wasn't enough information to be able to figure out how, how to value it. And I think a lot of people withdrew because of that. And then after they, they came back to us when the process didn't amount to a, a substantial bid, 
And they said, would you guys still like to do the option? You know, we changed our minds, we'll, we'll do that with you. We said, yes, but then we spent a year digging through warehouses, uh, barrack warehouses in Nevada and British Columbia to put the, the, um, put the puzzle back together and figure out like there was no metallurgy data. So you're like, le you, when you say warehouses, you're like, these are warehouses containing core that you guys were. No, no. These are just warehouses with boxes and boxes and boxes of files. I see. Like so paper, the physical data files. you're going through. Okay. Right? Remember, they did all the metallurgy work. Homestake did it. Barrick didn't do it. Homestake did it. So when you go to Barrick and go, where's all the metallurgy work? They're like, we didn't do the metallurgy. Homestake did. We found all the metallurgy at uh, SGS Labs up in Ontario. We hired them to help us and they're like, oh, by the way, we have all these boxes from 1992 with the metallurgy data. In Ontario, so like 5,000 kilometers from here, thereabouts, yeah. okay. I mean, it was a total <laughs> like forensics operation. Hmm. Then as we were opening the boxes, you know, we started to figure out, wait, whoa, whoa, did, you know, it's it just, it was gradually piecing it together. And, you know, there were, Barrick was built on a series of acquisitions. They acquired Homestake, they acquired Placer. Um, and, and, you know, over time, people who had the institutional knowledge left. And so we were trying to track down people, call them up and like pick their brains. Like, you know, who did you guys use to, to do this work or that work? And, and it took us a year to put the data together. What was there a moment like a holy shit moment? Like, look what we've got here. <laughs> Yes, there was. After we put out the, the first resource, um, I got incredibly excited. And then uh, we ran into issues and some screw ups on the uh, on the concentrate side. Uh, the original sort of sample concentrate that was created, uh, it was created from the hottest zone in the whole deposit. And, and it was just mismanaged. And it made it look like this was a, a very tainted toxic uh, project. And uh, when I, you know, was first hearing that information, I was like, oh, you know, like I've worked so hard at this thing and it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. Yeah. Right. This was in, this is in May of 2019. You could see it in our share price. It's funny how word somehow leaks. I don't know whether it's the consultants or something, but our share price had gone from 35 cents up to 50 and it went right back down to 35 cents while I was having these heart attacks. Um, and then we just kept with it and, and figured out technical solutions. So when you say the hottest zone, was this like the highest grade zone or like hottest as in terms of metallurgical well, complexity? There was, in the deposit, there, there are a couple different horizons. And the horizon that was historically mined was called the contact mudstone. And this is the, uh, the area where... Um, the hot minerals were flowing up and they're hitting the ocean floor and they're spewing out and sort of creating a layer on the ocean floor. Okay. Yeah. So the, hot, the hot fluids contained all these metals, gold, silver, they hit the cold ocean water and all precipitates out. But at that same level, mercury and arsenic and antimony are also precipitating out. Mm -hmm. That's the layer that Barrick mined that had two and a half ounces per ton. Right. And there's a direct correlation between grade and the amount of deleterious elements. So I think it's worth touching on very quickly why it matters that those deleterious elements are there. You know, what are the impacts or the potential impacts and the solutions you had to find to that? Because you know, people are probably listening to this and saying like, okay, arsenic, like who cares? Like, why is that important? Well, let me back up and, and just clarify one more thing. What we then discovered as we put together the whole resource is that layer is only 18% of the total deposit. There's a recirculation of fluids into the rhyolite horizon mm -hmm. and none of the deleterious elements go there. But we still have to deal with what do we do about this 18%, right? Which is the highest and grade layer as well too. It, it is, but Barrick mo mostly mine that out. Okay. But we're, we're, we have some remnants in that layer uh, that from, you know, when we dilute it all together, maybe that layer is like six grams and, and the other parts of the deposit are like three grams. And we net out at, at four grams. Um, and also, let me add, this is a refractory deposit, meaning it doesn't lend itself to conventional recovery of gold. You can't create dory just by leaching uh, the gold with a simple, like, 
like a cyanide uh, solution. It doesn't work. Gold won't release out of the, it's too tightly bound in the little sand particles. Um, so not only do we have deleterious elements, we've also got a refractory deposit. Mm -hmm. So your solutions to refractory deposits, you build an autoclave, you build a pox plant, you build, you do biox, um, you know, you have to resort to these unconventional approaches or the, the, the third or the, you know, another alternative is you just create a concentrate and you send it to smelters. The, the issue with the mercury and arsenic is that when you're creating that concentrate, some smelters will penalize you for certain extra elements that are included in your concentrate. Right. And if they're too high, they may not accept your, your concentrate. Right. So you can't sell your product potentially. And even if you can sell it, you're not getting the price you might otherwise get in a cleaner concentrate. Yeah. So yeah, how, how did you guys manage these problems? What, you know, what is the solution that Skeena settled upon? Yeah. Well, I think we had a big learning curve because I don't think there are that many projects in Canada that go the concentrate route. Most people, you know, I would almost say they just avoid refractory deposits. They're like, oh, this is, this is too much of a pain in the neck. I'm not, I'm not going down that road. Uh, the, the reason we could go down that road is because we have four gram material. Mm -hmm. So four grams gives us extra, extra cushion to deal with uh, some of these more difficult uh, aspects. Um, and keep in mind, we, we gradually discovered, well, the deleterious elements are only 18% of the deposit on a tonnage weighted basis. Uh, then the other thing that we learned is, look, there's, you know, the concentration of deleterious elements is critical. Um, you know, right now for copper concentrates into China, um, there, are, there are laws, China will not accept copper concentrates with over a half a percent arsenic. So if you've got a copper con and it's, it's 1% arsenic, you don't have anybody to sell it to. Mm. But what I learned, and I didn't realize this before, is that for gold concentrates, and they, they consider a gold con anything with over 20 grams gold, there are no restrictions on arsenic levels. Mm. Like, I didn't even know that. And, and we've had big companies that we're talking to, and they're like, oh, you can't send a con to China if it's over half a percent mercury, uh, half a percent arsenic. And... I mean, very sophisticated company said that to me. And I was like, well, actually you're wrong. Um, you, you know, through our process, we've learned, and I think anybody who's really active in the concentrate space already knows it, that uh, the restrictions on copper don't apply to gold cons because China wants gold con concentrates. Um, having said all that, China is implementing new restrictions on arsenic levels for gold concentrates, but the the guidance that 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 we've gotten is that the restriction levels could be around three or 4% arsenic for gold cons. And, and what that is likely to do is restrict a whole bunch of concentrates that are coming from Russia and CIS states into China that have higher uh, arsenic levels than that, which creates a, a gap, a void in the supply, you know, uh, circuit or supply chain that SK can step in and fill nicely because even in our worst, um, uh, worst year, the arsenic levels, uh, arsenic level in year one will be somewhere between one and 2% likely. <coughs> and, okay. and, and China's building more copper uh, smelters. So they need more concentrates. And I, and I actually think there's a huge opportunity in British Columbia and Canada in general to go relook at deposits that were discovered that were refractory. And people said, oh, it's refractory, I'm not touching it. You know, actually they may work. Okay. so. You guys, you know, you found the grade, you found the size, you addressed um, the metallurgical issues, you found workarounds and solutions to that. You know, the big knock often that British Columbia gets compared to other parts of the world is, of course, we touched on a little bit earlier, permitting issues. And, of course, sometimes the, the, the challenges um, and the length of working with First Nations groups, Aboriginal groups in British Columbia. Um, you guys have done a lot, a lot, a lot on all these things. I think it's something that sort of sets, um, in my mind, Skeena apart from many other companies that have worked that are currently working in British Columbia. The success you've brought to this, can we talk a little bit about that and the approaches you've taken? And I think maybe sort of lead off with 
um, you know, recent announcements you've had in terms of agreements and partnerships with the local First Nation you work most closely with, the Taltan. Yeah, uh, we, we operate in Taltan territory. Uh, we view ourselves as guests there. We don't, we're only there so long as we have their support. Uh, we feel really honored that two weeks ago they uh, uh, decided to make an investment in Skeena. We announced that they were buying 5 million of Skeena stock. Um, that came out of, frankly, years of discussion where they, uh, Chad Days, the president, uh, had said to me that they want to be owners uh, in natural resource projects in their territory. And, you know, I was, I thought this would be a great way, this would be a stepping stone towards that, that goal is buy some stock in Skeena. You know, have a, have a seat at the table with all our other shareholders and hopefully we can, we can make you money and and you'll you'll learn through that process. Um, so we were honored that they decided to do that. Uh, also, recently we announced uh, the creation of a new nature conservancy in the Golden Triangle. We took that project Spectrum, which was our first project. Uh, it happened to be located adjacent to an area that's very sacred to the Taltan Mounted Ziza, and and through a, a series of discussions and conversations, we came to realize how important that area is uh, culturally to the Taltan. And, and so we came up with this idea, why don't we protect that area as a, as a sort of wildlife nature conservancy? And we worked with the Taltan and the province to, to make that happen. And I look at all these things as just a natural evolution of the close relationship that we've developed. Uh, we, you know, when you when you consult, when you engage, you start to learn what's important to the other party, and I think they learn what's important to us, and we can come up with these very collaborative uh, solutions. Yeah, you know, you you say that a little bit nonchalantly, but I think you know, I I want to reiterate how unusual that this seems to me for sort of a the, the First Nations group in that area to actually invest you know hard dollars into the money and you said what it's five million dollars they put in and just was it like a private placement or were they buying it on the market how did you guys orchestrate that no it, it's a private placement and they i asked them to to if they would do us the favor of uh having it vest over a period of time mm -hmm. sort of like restricted stock that would vest over a three-year period and and they were willing to do it to show their long-term commitment to the project. So it's not just a quick flip, you know, kind of statement. It's, Hey, we want to be, when I say we, the tall Tan want to be owners in the projects in their territory. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, pretty enthusiastic about, you know, I want to help them do that. And, and I should add some other, two other points. Um, the tall Tan view themselves as a mining nation. They were mining thousands of years ago. They're mining obsidian from Mount Ziza, sort of like the tall volcano in their territory. Obsidian's a volcanic glass, and they used it to create spearheads and arrowheads and axes and, and tools. And they used those, they sold those tools to other First Nation groups. I mean, I had Chad tell me that tall obsidian from Mount Ziza showed up in tools found in South America. Um, you know, he, he credits... Mount Ziza is part of the reason the Taltan Nation were so uh, successful. Um, and they have a land area that's it's 10 percent of the total size of British Columbia. And so it's not only the mining history, it's also, uh, you know, they have a commercial, I guess, tradition in their in their culture. So why wouldn't they want to be owners in the natural resource projects? Um, I, I, I think it's just, you know, where in the world do you have a, a group of of local communities who understand mining as well as the Taltan do, um, you know, they're looking to make sure their younger generations are going to be executives in, you know, future junior mining companies. We've got five young Taltan people interning with us. Three of them are uh, mining engineers in university right now. Um, it's a nation that has a, a great future. And I think any companies that are, working in, in Taltan territory will will benefit from that expertise. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously BC is full of dozens of different First Nation bands. Um, and, you know, 
I'm by no means an expert on this, but I do know the tall 10 have a reputation of being very business minded, very, very commercial. You know, I think this is for, for investors all over the world listening to this, some who, um, you know, are cautious of investing in British Columbia. You know, speaking, I guess, specifically with the tall 10, whom you've had a lot of dealings with, you know, how do they view the development of their territory in general? How do they view, I guess, balancing the conservation of, you know, what you were just talking about earlier? What was the mountain, Mount St. Isa? Sound? Mount Aziza. Aziza versus, you know, also building mines. How do they how do they view the balance of that? And, you know, is there I'm going to stop my question there. Yeah. Wh what is what is their approach to this? It's a great question. And it's something that that's very top of mind to the leadership of the Taltan Nation. They have been working on a land use plan to identify here are the areas that we want to see development happen. And here are the areas within the Golden Triangle that we would like to to say are are kind of off limits, mm. and and I think if if you're a company that's that's going into the Golden Triangles to operate, all you got to do is sit down and have a conversation with Chad or other members of the uh, Taltan Central Government, and and they'll be pretty clear. Like this is a good area to go operate. This is probably an area that would be problematic. Is and, there... and I'm amazed at how few companies, and I'm talking very large companies in the world, will come into the Golden Triangle, buy a project start exploring and never have a conversation in advance after spending huge amounts of money. Why not have the conversation in advance and avoid all sorts of, uh, you know, conflict and fights? Is there, you know, when there are the no-go areas, you know, what are the reasons often given for this? Is it um, maybe uh, location with respect to a waterway? Is it caribou habitat? Is it sort of ancestral sac sacred sites? What are the reasons that we're seeing that? I mean, all of the above, right? The, the caribou is very sensitive. You know, water uh, projects close to the town of Iskip, where they're worried about uh, the water being affected that would that that goes into the town. Um, you know, near Mount Ziza, like we we learned that, you know, kind of the hard way with um, with Spectrum. Uh, they don't want to see a big mine built right next to a mountain that's that's very sacred to the Toltan nation. I mean, it's kind of obvious in hindsight, it's kind of obvious stuff, but the only way you, as a company, you're going to know it is you have to, you have to sit down and have a conversation. You have to, uh, you know, have an open dialogue. Okay. Well, well, you know, we're coming up on an hour now, so I want to ask you just a few more questions. Uh, you know, these can be pretty quick questions, but there, there are things I like to to try to ask everyone uh, who come on the podcast here. Um, you know, a lot of people listening to this at home, of, of course, investors, but another group is younger professionals or would-be professionals in the mining space that are just getting their footing or working their way up. And, you know, you come at the, the sector from sort of a non-traditional background. You're, you know, you didn't start your earliest career in mining, but do you have advice for anyone who does want to step into this, this sector and let's let's say someone that is, you know, wants to start their own deal for the first time, wants to get involved in building a company, um, putting something together, be it an exploration or development stage company. Do you have any advice for where to get started in that or how you would approach that? Not everybody has a uranium deposit in their backyard. So I think uh, <laughs> that's an unusual example. Uh, I think the best way is, is go work for somebody who's doing successful deals. Like you can avoid a lot of mistakes if you have a good mentor, uh, can save you a lot of time and uh, heartache. Uh, I felt fortunate to work with Ron for a bunch of years and, and I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from Peter Groskopf, learned a lot from Keith Peck. Um, you know, you, you gotta find mentors that you can uh, learn from. I mean, I think it's, it's probably the same for any, any industry out there. Would you say that people need to be in a, you know, mining hub like a Vancouver or a Toronto, or, I mean, you did this a little bit sort of internationally, um, but I assume you spent a lot of time here. Yeah, I, I thought I would be, I would be living in New York and Ron would be in BC and everything. I would raise money and, uh, and not have to go to, uh, uh, to Canada that much. And, and that went right out the window because there were so many problems. I was uh, basically living in a hotel, trying to deal with all the problems uh, that were coming up. 
Um, I think you need in the early parts of your career, you need to be um, in the in the city where it's all happening. So I think you got to be in Vancouver um, if you're if you're starting out in this career. Do you ever hear um, any advice that you consistently hear given to young professionals or people operating in the sector that you disagree with that you think is wrong? Is there anything you hear over and over again? Well, what I don't like in the sector is uh, the promotional um, ad, you know, practices like get a, you know, get a piece of moose patcher and promote, promote, promote and raise money. I think that's terrible. And I, and I hate seeing young people sucked into that sort of, uh, you know, side of the business where it's, it's mine, the market, um, not really build, not, not find real minds that have technical merit. And, and I have to say, I really admire the careers of Lucas Lundin and, and Ross Beatty. Like they're guys who have just gotten it done. Um, uh, so I think, I, I think Vancouver has room for improvement to try to steer younger people to the right side of the business, which is, you know, realize the incredible technical talent, technical talent that exists to go out and find deposits and build mines, not just do stock market plays. Yeah, no, good advice. For people that do have good projects, or I should say projects they believe are good projects and that they truly believe in, you know, there's lots of setbacks on the way. You talked about some of the ones you guys have experienced over the last few years before hitting the sort of success you're seeing now. What advice do you have for people that are in a setback and, you know, what do you do? How do you work through it? Is there any real key takeaways you've learned from your experience over the last few years? Yeah, there's there's one word, perseverance. Like, you just got to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And we're so fortunate to be living in, you know, the Western democracies that we live in, whether it's Europe, United States, or Canada, where if you do work hard, uh, you can achieve success beyond your wildest imaginations. We're we're so incredibly fortunate to have that opportunity. There, there's so much of the world's population that never has a chance. Um, so, you know, given that that good fortune, we have to take advantage of it by just working hard. And, and the number of people I've seen, you know, over my short career in mining who've been like su- successful beyond anything I could have imagined. Um, it, it's more than just luck. There's a, there's a consistent pattern here in, in uh, you know, these companies in Vancouver of success. So, you know, all the ingredients are there. You just have to keep after it. You know, when you, when you fail, undoubtedly you will. You'll fail once, twice, three times, four times, five. If you just keep after it, this is a business that, that has a ter- terrific upside. All right. Well, I know you've had a busy day. I very, very much appreciate you sitting down with us this afternoon. Before we say goodbye, what should people know about Skeena that I haven't touched on? What do people have to look forward to over the coming months? Is there anything we should be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, SK Creek, I think will be, um, I think it'll be the third biggest mine, gold mine, gold equivalent mine in Canada. And, uh, I don't think the market, the wider market uh, recognizes or understands that yet. And I'm not trying to be promotional in, in saying this. Uh, I, I, you know, I, on another conversation, I can walk you through all the, the points, you know, why that's, that's very likely to happen. Uh, but it's, it's gonna be a crown jewel in the portfolio of natural resource projects for Canada. Can and you- it will create can you Go give ahead. us the cliff notes of those points now? Because I think there's going to be a, one, a lot of people that want to hear them, including me. Yeah. I, I, you know, how many mines are there in Canada that produce over 400,000 ounces a year? There's only two. Um, so I, I think SK Creek is, is going to be bigger than that. Um, in our PEA, it was a production profile of 300,000 ounces a year, gold equivalent. That's about 75% gold, 25% silver. That was the PEA based on a 4 million ounce resource. The latest resource we put out uh, just a week ago is 5.6 million ounces. So we've already seen pretty significant growth. Um, You know, we're going to be drilling this summer. There's a whole host of reasons why we should be able to increase that at least by another million ounces. 
So, you know, the real question is what's the conversion ratio from resource to reserves? Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it's anywhere between 65, it'll be between 65 and 80%. So if it's 70%, you can quickly do the math and see it could be pushing 5 million ounces of reserves. This is where it gets exciting because as Mark Bristow, the CEO of Barrick likes to say, a tier one gold project has 5 million ounces reserves and 500,000 ounces a year of production. There are only 13 tier one gold mines in the world, right? So that shows you what a rare opportunity SK is if it can make it to that, that level. And I think we're within uh, shooting distance of getting there. Uh, so, you know, I view this project SK, and I think Craig Perry shares my opinion. It's, at least in my case, I don't think I'll ever work on a project of this magnitude again in my career. Like it's kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm. So, you know, I say to the whole management team, this, I mean, you're in the, you're in the Super Bowl, you're in the NBA finals here. Like you got to give it everything you got uh, to keep pushing this thing aggressively towards that potential opportunity of making another a tier one gold mine in the world. Something that everyone in BC and Canada can be very proud of. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is Mr. Walter Cole, CEO of Skeena Resources. Walt, thank you very much for taking some time out of your day today. Yeah, thank you. Julia. All right, take care.